So two types of solutions we typically consider is first of all we have once again the plane wave uh, in 3D that has the form of E is some E naught E to the I K dot product R minus omega T and that's the one where you have a plane wave perpendicular to the propagation direction of course this plane wave solution assumes that these planes are infinitely large planes that goes on forever and in reality of course that doesn't happen but for something like a laser beam that may be you know two millimeters in diameter when we're talking about the wavelength here is in you know 400 nanometers or even a thousand nanometer it's much much smaller so in the middle of the laser beam we can approximate this as a plane wave solution as well and it's also a justification that we can think of laser beam as just a single ray of light that we can talk about in geometric optics in a couple weeks since the EM wave is a different type of wave let's quickly make sure that our relationship between the intensity and amplitude still holds of course now we have two waves going on um, say for still simplest to look at the plane wave we have both the electric field modulation and also the magnetic field modulation and each of those contributes some kind of energy that we're transporting technically some power that we're transporting over some area giving us the intensity so let's start with energy thinking back to your ENM course uh, remembering we derived the how much energy the electric field holds by looking at the energy density and that's given to be epsilon naught over 2 times e squared this is derived from having an air filled or you know technically vacuum filled capacitor that charges up holding more e over time and how much energy it takes to do that similarly we have this expression for our magnetic field and that's derived from an air core solenoid um, as the magnetic field builds up how much energy we're holding so from these energy density then we can multiply by volume to get the energy divide by time get power so on and then finally get our intensity so what volume are we talking about well we're going to try and capture a specific plane it's got dx as a length and some kind of area. Um, the area is arbitrary because plane wave is uniform in the whole plane, so the E stays the same. So the energy, let's just stick for the electric case for now. The E is equal to the energy density times A times dx. So to get power then, power E, we need E, E divided by time. Well, how much time are we talking about? Well, it's the time that it takes for the plane to move from this low dx to the next low dx. So it has moved dx in that time. Knowing the speed of light, we can figure out then the time is dx divided by c. Distance over speed gives you time. The rest stays dx cancels out and remembering that our c is equal to 1 over the square root of epsilon naught mu naught we can arrange this to be c epsilon naught over 2 e square over a moving down a little bit more Lastly, we have our intensity due to our electric field. We just divide out the A because it's power over area. So we're left with that, which is optimistic because once again, we have the field amplitude square involved here. We'll do it a little more rigorously in a minute. Let's just finish the magnetic case first. It's very similarly as, as it follows. Goes two mu naught e 
squared a d x and then p e is then very similarly to d squared a and we have the intensity due to the magnetic field oops the mu does the mu doesn't belong on top two mu naught d squared now one interesting thing to notice though the total intensity of course is both of them combine but if you look at just the two intensity expression using once again c is equal to one over epsilon mu naught epsilon naught and that we remember from the pointing vector e is equal to c times b putting all that in here we find that this simply becomes that which is the same as that so the total intensity is twice as much as the intensity of just the electric part which is equal to the intensity of twice the magnetic part so even though because of E equals CB we often like to talk about just the magnetic sorry just the electric part both part is equally important in the sense that they both transport the same power so bear that in mind and then finally we have to talk about not so much the instant sorry the intensity at any given point but we have to average that over time so time average um, I guess maybe better notation would be the expectation over time just because we're receiving the intensity at a certain spot over a given time once again at 10 to the 15 Hertz or so so we're not gonna see very much otherwise just be rigorous about it we're gonna once again run into C epsilon naught now times 2 so the 2 goes away e square and we want the time average of this uh, with the plane wave it's the amplitude square cosine square omega t at a specific x so when you do this expectation this is the only part that changes with time and we know that's one half because cosine square looks like that and smack in the middle is the one half so then the final final bit is actually that to be specific that <laughs> this is the actual amplitude what we were talking about before was just the field at any one point in any case we finally arrange, arrive at our needed expression which is the average intensity is proportional to the field amplitude square so that still holds so that's one type of solution the plane wave another type of solution is the spherical wave spherical wave and that's the one where you have e is equal to e naught over r e i k r r being the radius from a source and that's the one where you have a dot and it emanates out in spherical shells now to kind of marry these two representation between the spherical wave and the plane wave we have what's called the Huygens principle Huygens principle what Huygens principle states it's basically a way of visualizing waves in a slightly different way um, what he's saying is given a plane wave or any wave actually any wave we draw the wavefront you imagine that every single point on that wavefront is making spherical waves and so you have a lot of these what we call wavelets little wavelets which then ultimately recomprise to make the next wavefront you can see how these may have get a different color here all of these kind of add up to give you one way circle away from like that one like that one like that one like that and it forms the next plane wave 
and then again you have another wavefront you have all these dots to make wavelets and then they also form and then you form the next wave and so on and so forth and that's Cregan's principle by breaking down the wave into wavelets now why is this useful well is this useful whenever um, the wave hits an aperture so say we have a solid wall here and only one of the points allowed to go through all these wavelet gets blocked but this one's allowed to go through and this one makes spherical waves coming out and that's very typical of what we see for waves so it's one way of visualizing how um, planar wavefront as you see here planar wavefront turns into spherical wavefronts as you move through an aperture which is basically a hole in the wall this also works when you have when you're obstacle. moving past off so you have an obstacle like this and you have your wave fronts popping through and of course these wave fronts still mix like that but this on the corner nothing combines with it and so you get wave fronts that looks like this now the real place it's really useful is when we have more than one slit say so we have a wall and we have two slits in it wave fronts wave fronts all these gets blocked except for these two so we have one spherical wave here and we have not a spherical wave here now this should look very familiar because we just looked at this in terms of 2d sound wave interference so we also have 2d light wave interference and we also form maximum and minimum fringes and we'll be looking at that in detail very very soon but to note this is basically what everyone talks about in terms of Yang's double slit experiment and this is one of the definitive experiment that brings out the wave nature of the light we can't explain this by treating light as a bunch of laser beam we have to treat it as a wave so let's take a look at this a little more quantitatively